Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Abraham, or Abe Fuchs, and it's my absolute honor to be here in, in front of you to declare my uh, candidacy for the uh, office of uh, New York State Assembly District uh, 25. I want to thank all of you for, for being here, and um, I, <clears throat> I want to thank uh, Phil Sika for giving me this opportunity. I want to I want to thank Bill Lewis for for teaching me a lot about uh, politics and being my mentor, and I want to thank Sonny Hahn for encouraging me to run. I was born in Washington D.C. in 1956, and I am 56. I went to a Jewish religious day school in Masifta Forest Hills, which is a Jewish high school. I attended three years of rabbinical seminary after high school. I studied at Empire State College, which is part of SUNY, where I did extremely well until I got to a course in American government. At that time, I wasn't interested in politics. I, I, I didn't understand it, and I didn't want to understand it. Perhaps an overreaction, but that made me drop out of college. Ironically, when I left college, I slowly did develop a curiosity about politics. So I went on to work as a janitor and a dishwasher for a couple of years. Then I found out that the city offered training in various uh, vocations. I picked bookkeeping and did that for a few years. Eventually, I, en I ended up in the post office, <coughs> excuse me, where I worked for 25 years. I'm retired now from the PO since 2009. Since 1989, I've been involved with real estate as an investment vehicle. My parents came to this country in their early 50s as Jewish Polish refugees from World War II. My father was a Polish soldier fighting Germany when the Soviet Union occupied Poland, and he was taken prisoner as one of the 300,000 Polish soldiers that the Russian army held as POWs for the duration of the war. My father ended up in Siberia as a result. My mother was in a concentration camp, not a death camp, although as she explained to me once, many die from disease and exhaustion even in the non-death camps. My parents had modest secular educations, as was the norm in the Polish villages where they grew up. But they had a strong rooting in religion. My father was fluent in many of the Old Te Testament texts, and my mother took Bible study seriously as well. Religion taught character, and character is what they had. My father was stern and hardworking. He owned a small poultry business and did well. My mother was congenial and compassionate. I feel that I learned much from both of them. I was a young child in the, in the late 50s and early 60s, but somehow I took in the aura of the time. We weren't allowed to watch TV growing up, but later on when I saw shows like Leave it to Beaver or Father Knows Best, I somehow felt that I could relate to them. That was a time of manners and moral certitudes, even if that included inherent contradictions with our civil rights laws. But in the mid to late 60s, a torrent of change swept through society, and all the hidden skeletons of society came washing up. At school, I remember that I couldn't understand what the war in Vietnam was all about, and no one else could either. Society was splitting apart with the hippies on one side and the preppies on the other, but somehow everything as a society that we had once considered sacred and honorable was now being tossed aside. Religion, traditional values, law and order, respect for authority was all being tossed aside and served just as fodder for the cultural revolution which many had joined. See, society was truly bifurcated and, and from then on, nothing would be the same. Promiscuous sex, drugs, noise that passed from music, crime in the streets, chaos in the schools were all in vogue. Even the US president seemed to go through a downgrade. From Kennedy, who aside from the Bay of Pigs was solid and centered, we went to Johnson, who was morose, to Nixon, who was obviously paranoid, to Ford, who seemed stilted, to Carter, who, who came across as meek. Not until Ronald Reagan, did we finally get back to good old American optimism and strength of character. When Reagan tripped up, however, with Iran-Contra, it seemed to bring up moral confusion. Once again, it was a big disappointment. 
When he came clean with that, America forgave him. Since then, we've had George Bush Sr., who seemed a bit out of touch with the common man. Clinton, who was good with domestic affairs and stepped up to stop the Bosnian atrocities, was totally flat-footed to deal with Osama bin Laden. George W. Bush had some good instincts, but was not a studied man. Barack Obama seems hollow, but his drones do hit the mark. The bifurcation of, of American society persists. We can't, agree, we can't agree on anything. Just the other day when I was trying to establish a, camp, a campaign finance bank account for my political committee, a bank rep told me that the bank policy prohibits establishing a bank account for a political party in fear of alienating other customers who don't agree with that political party's platform. She was wrong because I had already gotten authorization before from the customer service center, but I have no doubt that bank policy was considering such a prohibition. The parties argue with each other, and meanwhile the continuing big deficits and, and the huge debt is robbing our, our, our children's future. Society is busy, fight, busy fighting over God knows what, while Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae were allowed to become a big sham, the monstrous mortgage fraud debacle and banking abuses explosion devastated the economy. Bernie Madoff couldn't be stopped in, in time, even after a financial reporter practically rubbed the nose of the, of the FEC in, in Madoff's mess. We don't need thousand page tombs of regulations either to stave off such abuses. In, in Bernie Madoff's case, all we needed to see was that he wasn't segregating customer funds in a separate brokerage account. Forrest Gump would have noticed that. Let's talk about public school education. There must be enough reasonable people to agree that it shouldn't take $300,000 in three years to fire an incompetent teacher. In the 50s, chewing gum in school was considered an infraction. Now the occurrence of violence, bullying, victims horrifically shooting up schools in revenge, or victims sadly taking their own lives is practically reaching into public schools of any neighborhood. Why must parents beg or wait for lotteries to get into private or charter schools? And still, tens of thousands will not be afforded that opportunity. School vouchers for any academically qualified private or charter school should be every American parent's right. Private, private school tuition is typically two-thirds the price of, of, of uh, public school. And private schools are most often better. So why do we have to put up with this? Some say the argument is that charters or some private schools don't admit everyone. Yes, if they want to be qualified for vouchers, then aside from religious considerations, they should have to admit everyone. And many private or charter schools are willing and able to do that. Public schools are failing in America because 30% of students on average are dropping out of high school, and for minorities, it's closer to 40%. On top of that, according to a public service announcement by Governor Andrew Cuomo, New York, New York schools rate near the bottom nationally by test scores and near the top of the list for being most expensive. Why do New Yorkers have to put up with that? Aside from problems arising from school, we have to look at the sad reality that quite a number of children are coming from homes where there is no spiritual environment or good role models to speak of. Many kids are overweight and are addicted to social media to the point that something as crazy as texting while driving has become a problem. But if society would come together and leave ideologies aside, reasonable and moral people can agree on universal values of character education to be taught in public schools. We all agree that traits of honesty, loyalty, self-reliance, humility, compassion, hard work, and respect for others are essential for a healthy and productive life. Let sociologists and psychologists, along with members of the clergy, devise such a course. While I'm at it, I think government-sponsored parenting classes could be an idea that, that would pay off as well, but I can understand the argument that that is not the role for government. On the other fronts, yes, we need to fight for stricter guidelines for abortions. I must admit that I have not heard of the practice of, of gender side until very recently where even here in the U.S., expectant mothers some, sometimes decide during a late-term pregnancy, meaning after 20 weeks of gestation, to terminate a certain gender fetus, usually female. Reasonable people should be able to unite on this one to condemn this practice as being barbaric. 
A reasonable society could show more concern by reaching out to young and frightened expectant mothers, mothers to make a, adoption centers more welcoming, warm, and accessible. Why should Planned Parenthood be the only household name when it comes to services for women? Where is the equivalent of a franchise chain of adoption centers? As far as the economy is concerned, I agree with Bill Clinton's approach with the Clinton Global Initiative. There are three and a half million jobs that Americans are not filling due to lack of training. We need more math, science, engineering, and technology students to fill these jobs. And once these jobs are filled, that would of course lead to even more economic activity. I know it sounds traitorous and I'm mentioning Bill Clinton at, at a Republican club meeting, but we must give credit for good ideas no matter where they come from. FDR signed the GI Bill for American servicemen to get free education after the war. That enabled many to be educated and enter into the middle class. I myself benefited from, from government sponsored training when I was trained by the city to be a bookkeeper, as I've mentioned before. We should be able to hear each other regardless of party. President Reagan and House Speaker Tip O'Neill were able to work out a deal together on Social Security to make it solvent. Of course, we should keep taxes low and spending down. But under the current scenario, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea, and just give me a chance here, to actually raise taxes on the rich and lower taxes for the middle class. This is revenue neutral, which is different than liberals raising taxes to spend on government programs. In our economy now, with corporations holding on to $2 trillion and nowhere to spend it for expansion or job creation, we need more ability of the middle class to spend. Businesses would benefit from the higher demand and stronger purchasing power from the middle class. This is what Robert Reich, Clinton's Secretary of Labor, is saying, and I think it makes a lot of sense. As far as government spending goes, if I were elected into office, I would do everything I could to root out waste and corruption. I think we should have more robust watchdog groups as part of the government to, order, to audit other areas of, of government. In theory, that should work. The GAO was supposedly a watchdog, but apparently no one was watching it. There should be more checks and balances that way. Hydrofracking. Hydrofracking is a combination of the words hydraulic fracturing. The environmentalists are against hydrofracking, which could provide 50,000 jobs for the next 10 years or so and cheap energy that could supply New York's needs for decades. President Obama has said that he is in favor of, high, uh, of fracking when it is done safely. Governor Andrew Cuomo is inclined to approve it, but is still waiting for all objections from different interest groups to be processed through. Jerry Iannisi, who is running on the Democratic ticket for this assembly seat, has said straight out that he is against it. Rory Lansman, who is the incumbent from running in the congressional primary, points to the radioactive elements that would be exposed from the process of fracking for why he is against it. The DEC, Department of Environmental Con Conservation, which is New York State's regulatory body that regulates this type of energy mining, issued a general environmental impact statement in 2008 and, and, a two, and a supplemental one in 2011. It's this report which lays out all the dangers and risks of fracking and what can be done to either eliminate or substantially reduce them. New York has the toughest regulations regarding hydrofracking in the country. The report states that fracking, when done correctly, would not cause undue risk from radiation. Technology is here to stay is a fact. We rely on nuclear energy along with coal mining and oil drilling. BP is not a good example of what can go wrong because that outfit with its horrendous safety violations record should have been shut down well before the Gulf accident. This is what reasonable people can agree on. Extremists in either direction do no one any good. I'm running for this assembly seat because I can work out legislation with Republicans and Democrats alike. I can clean out wrongdoing and build on things that are good and initiate worthy legislation of my own, as I've suggested earlier. I've done well for the institutions that I was a part of. In the post office, when I was done with my daily work and there was nothing else for me to do with the remaining time, I would seek permission to clock out and charge the unused time to WAP, that's leave without pay. When I was in the Jamaica General Post Office, I learned on my own the boundaries to all the Jamaica zip codes. When a Jamaica Uncoded later came up, I bid on it without having to train and thereby saving the post office money. In the over 20 years that I'm in real estate, I renovated six small properties. 
I treat my tenants well and tend to any problem that needs repair or replace whatever needs replacement. If I'm elected, I would bring that same level of service to the public sector. Governing shouldn't be as ineffective and cacophonous as, as we've seen in the last 20 years. I want to get in there, clean house, and do some good. That's why I'm running, but, but I will need your support. Right now, I need support with petitions, and, and later on, I'll, I'll pass out some papers. Uh, thank you very much, and, and God bless. Fracking is extracted from shale rock. For those that don't know, so. Yes. How many, how, many how many companies have done it successfully without polluting the water supply? Well, is that your question? Yes. Well, uh, from what I've read, and I'm, I'm by, by no means an expert, and I, like I said, I'm going by the, uh, the DEC's uh, uh, report, uh, General em Environmental Impact Statement Report, and th their recommendation is that it, it can be managed. The risks can be managed. There, there were some uh, accidents, but uh, New York has the toughest uh, uh, regulations in the country. And New York is taking fracking very ser seriously, and, and, and that's why it's taking such a long time for it to, to come about. Yes. Um, with the hydrofracking, that's uh, pumping water into deep into the ground and yeah. um, stirring um, the shale up to create energy. Um, a lot of times well, it's it releasing the energy. Correct. A lot of times it releases uh, potential seismic uh, earthquakes and stuff. And stuff. I've heard a lot of uh, positives and negative sources, but I have heard of companies that have positively found solutions to do it successfully. From what I've read about the seismic uh, activity, it is not, it is not that disruptive. It, it, there is some seismic activity, but it, it's not to the point where it could really cause a lot of damage. 